This week's book review is on joining the new rich, living anywhere, and escaping the 9 to 5. This week we got the 4 hour work week. What's up guys, Clark from ClarkDanger.com. Super stoked on this one. Uh, the book review that we're going to be talking about. Huge impact in my life, the 4 hour work week. Without this book, I don't think I would have traveled to Hawaii or Southeast Asia and had the time of my life. I didn't think it was possible. And this was the book I read first that really showed me that it was possible, that you can work and travel the world at the same time, even if you're in college, even if you have other commitments, um, X, Y, and Z. You know, it's written by a guy named Tim Ferriss, who I happen to really resonate with. He's probably one of my biggest mentors out there. I learned a lot from him. Uh, controversial figure. Some people love him. Some people hate him. But whether you do or don't, we're going to explore the four hour work week. One of my favorite books. Let's go over the 10 best ideas from it right now. So starting off, what this book is about is escaping the nine to five, live anywhere and join the new rich. Basically saying that in our society, the plan is get educated the first 20 years of your life, work the next 40 years of your life, and then retire and live the good life for the next 20 years, right? And that's kind of the deferred life plan. So you work really hard right now for some later date that we can kick back, relax, and really live once we have the money. And in this book, Tim argues that why wait? What's the holy grail at the end of our life justifying wasting our energy, our youth, our excitement right here and now that we're putting off? And I like to think of it as this. This is the first point is viewing the three currencies of life. You have three stages of life right here. You're young, you're an adult, and you're old. Now, the three currencies of your life are time, energy, and money. At any stage in life, you probably really only have two. When you're young, you don't have any money, but you got a lot of time and a lot of energy. When you're an adult, you don't have any time because you're working, but you got a lot of energy and a lot of money. Then when you're old, you have a lot of money and a lot of time, but not much energy. So how do you make the most out of all three of those stages? You start valuing currencies beyond just money. And so this book really opened my eyes to traveling, uh, to starting a business, to going for it in my 20s. And that's the main reason I like this book, valuing other currencies beyond just money. The next point is the new rich. This is a thing Tim talks about a lot in this book, that the new rich uh, value things based on a freedom multiplier. These all start with W. And the more W's you control, the more free you are. Okay, the W's are what you do, where you do it, when you do it, and with whom you do it with. Is that, yeah, what, when, whom, where. Okay, and so all, the amount of W's you control means how free you are. So if you control all of those W's, you're, you don't report to anybody. And that's what the new rich wants. And again, rather this job, this book doesn't mean you have to quit your job, guys, or or it doesn't mean you have to start a business, or it doesn't mean you have to walk out on your family so you can control all those W's. That's not what it's saying. It's just exploring uh, alternative paths beyond just the standard narrative of 20 years education, 40 years working, and 20 years retirement. So how do you join the new rich? How do you live anywhere and escape the nine to five? Well, in the book, it goes over an acronym to do so. And the acronym is DEAL, D-E-A-L. It stands for Definition, Elimination, Automation, and Liberation. And if you do all those, then you can join the new rich, escape the nine to five, and live anywhere. So let's walk through them real quick. Definition, basically saying, what do you want? If everything turned out the way you want it, if you had all the time, all the money in the world, what would you do? What is your dream? What do you want to travel? Do you want to work anywhere? Um, basically replacing the self-limiting beliefs, getting out of your own head and getting it on paper in your journal or however you want to do it, define what you want. Okay. Second step is eliminate. And we'll get into this in the, another point. It's basically saying there's so much, only so much time we have. And if we try and do everything, it's like trying to eat a steak in one bite. We got to take little bite-sized chunks and avoid the unimportant and eventually get to where we want to go. This elimination is eliminating things that are unimportant. Basically, if you're complaining about not having enough time, 
but you're checking email 50 times a day or on social media for two hours, we got to realize that if we cut out the email and social media, there's five hours right there that we've reclaimed, okay? So elimination, eliminating things, basically simplifying down um, your life. Automation, this is learning to put cash flow on autopilot. So elimination frees up your time. Automation frees up your money. Um, not to get too into it, there's a lot of examples in the book on how to make passive income, which I know is a hot topic right now. Um, some people say it's a scam. Some people say it's not possible. Others that are doing it say it's the only way to become rich. So passive income is basically automation. And then L is liberation. And this is basically focusing on freeing up your location, where you do everything from. So working remotely or um, on an internet-based business that you start. Uh, location can be traveling as well. So location. All right, the fourth biggest point, now that we've kind of set the book up, let's start getting into the content of it. The big point that I got was that having all the time in the world, that fantasy that you and I both have, if we didn't have to work at all, well, that's not really the end goal because we'd get so bored sipping pina coladas on the beach, right? There's only so many you can sip before you want to work. And I've gone over this, that we have that triangle of work, rest, and play. And then all those three need to be aligned in order for us to really feel like we're doing a good job in life. And that if we just have all the time in the world, that's not what we really want. Because that's like having all the play in the world and all the rest in the world. You need a certain amount of work to keep you happy. And you need a certain amount of rest. You need a certain amount of play. You need all three of those things. So removing the fantasy from my mind of, well, I just want all the time in the world so I can just... Uh, do X, Y, and Z was really uh, was really gratifying because I realized how much I can enjoy work if I'm doing the right kind. All right, the fifth big point is uh, why retirement sucks. This was a great little bit in here. I, everyone thinks retirement's the best years of your life, but uh, Tim kind of argues the opposite. He says that it, retirement's bad for three reasons. The first is that it, it assumes you hate what you do, right? If you want to retire, if you think it's going to be great, well, what are you running from? What's the job that you don't want to, that you want to escape from so you can no longer do it, right? So that's the first one. The second one is that the cost of living keeps increasing and our retirement really doesn't. Unless it's invested, unless it's making interest. I mean, inflation is what, like 3% a year or something like that? So if you retire for 20 years, you know, it might not seem like a lot at first, but over time, our money is going to start shrinking. And the third one is that if you're someone who can retire 20 years before you die or at 60 or 65 or whatever, chances are you had a good enough work ethic and you were self-motivated, self-starting that when you get to retirement, you're going to be so bored by week three, you're going to want to go back to work. So those are kind of three really cool points about why retirement's not necessarily the goal. All right, the next point is a quote from the book I really liked. It says, a person's success or failure is determined by the amount of uncomfortable conversations he or she is willing to have. Um, I love this because it's talking about that our success in life is determined by how willing we are to get uncomfortable. That's talking about, you know, with uncomfortable conversations with your job like negotiating a salary, a salary uh, is plus or minus, but I think it goes deeper with getting uncomfortable, getting out of your comfort zone. Things that are uncomfortable, let's look at them. Traveling unfamiliar places, that's uncomfortable. Um, living in a new location, that's uncomfortable. Starting a new job, uh, dating and being in a relationship at first, that's uncomfortable. But also look at what's rewarding. Those four things can push you uh, to become better, can get you out of your comfort zone, which is so cliche, but so true, and make you grow as a per person. It forces you to grow. And so the more willing we are to step outside of the box, step outside of our comfort zone, to try new experiences, I think the more we can develop and the more we can grow. So that's why our success or failure is kind of determined by how willing we are to get uncomfortable. The next point is traveling on the cheap. i went to Southeast Asia because I read when I was 18 in this book, I was 22 when I went to Southeast Asia, but I read that you could live like a king for $500 a month in Thailand or something along the lines. And I just implanted that in my mind. And four years later, 
I was doing it. And um, I didn't realize how cheap everything else was. Of course, this is coming from America to wherever. I'm not sure where you're watching this from. But realizing that, you know, travel doesn't have to be thousands and gazillions of dollars. It can be cheaper than where you're currently living. You know, in Seattle, a one bedroom can go for $1,100 a month. In Thailand, I knew, I knew three guys that liked it so much over there when we were backpacking, they decided they were renting a house. And the whole house cost all three of them together, I think it was $500 or $600. They offered me a room in it. And I was like, man, I got I to gotta get on the road. I don't know if I'm planning on staying in Thailand for four extra months. But they were just having a good time and living over there for like a couple hundred bucks. Three guys pitched together, got a house. And so we, we work to pay our rent, right? Then that's something we have to do. But if you're young right now watching this, I mean, you could work, save up enough money washing dishes and go ride a motorcycle through China. I mean, it doesn't really matter what job you do. As long as you save some amount of money and go somewhere cheaper, you can live pretty good. Uh, Rolf Potts was talking on here about vagabonding, his book, which is actually part of the four hour work week kind of reading list. Um, so if you want to watch that interview right there with Rolf Potts, really good stuff on uh, what we've been talking about. The next big idea is less is not laziness. So doing more is not always better. And this is something we know, but it's harder to practice that the consistency is better than the intensity, right? So example, look at the gym. We think that doing less is lazy, right? That if you do an hour and a half long workout, you're less lazy than the person who goes in there for 20 minutes. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I mean, you get this exercise stimulus in the first 20 minutes that gives you arguably 80% of the benefit, depending on what you're doing and how long and how intensity, right? So if, in other words, if you did 20 minutes a day for five days a week, that's way better than doing one or two workouts for an hour and a half, uh, two days a week, right? So by doing less, less time, we think that that's kind of lazy. Like you're only doing 20 minutes, man, and then you're hitting the shower and heading home. What's wrong with you? But in reality, it's not. It's actually smart because the consistency is the most important part. A good example is online business or YouTube channels, right? A lot of people think they have to quit their job and start a business from scratch. And, you know, that's kind of the burn the ships mentality that Fernando Cortez, when he wanted to commit, he burned his ships and he never looked back and that's why he won the battle. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that you can do less and you can do it more often. You'll get a better result. I think you put a, a ton of stress on yourself if you say, I've never done anything like this, so tomorrow I'm quitting. It'd be way smarter if you slowly build a YouTube channel over the course of two or three years. Time's the hardest thing. Time's the most valuable resource, right, that we talked about. And that's the thing that's really going to build it. Because it doesn't matter how good your content is, you need patience and you need time for it to catch on. That's really what you need. And then it grows exponentially. But you can't force it. Um, so this is a tangent, this is a rant on how less is not lazy. You don't need to go all in 100% of the time on everything. You can allow yourself some rest and to sit back on it. Number nine, uh, this one sounds crude, but don't shit where you eat. If you should have separate places for everything. And that psychologically is beneficial because if you, so for me, you know, this is my bedroom and I work here. Well, sometimes it's hard for me to wind down because I'm working, filming, editing in my bedroom. And then when I come back at the end of a day, I'm like, oh, I feel like I'm at work again. So for me, I found it really beneficial to have separate places for the gym. So I don't work out at home. I work out at a gym uh, where I go to a coffee, coffee office shop where I do all my editing and where I relax here, and then upstairs, you know, I, I do some more personal stuff like meditating or reading or journaling. So having all separate places, man, that's a, that's a big jump in mental clarity than trying to have everything in one place. All right, the best lesson from this book, drum roll, is the 80-20 principle and Parkinson's law. So the 80-20 principle has gotten talked about a lot over the last five years. It basically comes from an economist who noticed that in his garden, 80% of his pea pods were producing only 20% of the peas. But when he looked at the other 20% of his pea pods, 
he noticed they were yielding 80% of his peas. So I think his name was Pareto. He looked at um, the traffic. He said, this is a fascinating pattern. So he was studying traffic and he noticed that 80% of the traffic occurred on 20% on of the streets. That if you look in a business, 20% of the customers give you 80% of the profit. If you look in your closet, probably 20% of your clothes give you 80% of the wear. I know this thing, I'm wearing it in nearly every video, right? It's not always, you know, 80-20 exactly on the money. Sometimes it's 90-10, could be 60-40. So in your life, maybe 80% of your results are coming from 20% of your efforts. For example, for me, you know, with this YouTube thing, like I could just do these in one take and save probably 80% of the time with the editing and the audio and fidgeting and all that stuff. Um, why I don't do that, I don't know. Maybe I should start doing it. But for example, you know, if you wanted to start a YouTube channel, 20% of your input could get you 80% of the results. So how much does editing and quality and all that really matter? It might be a 20%, not an 80%. And then in the book, he goes into Parkinson's law as well, which is a really, really cool thing that says tasks will expand to the time you allow for them. Think back to college. When were you doing your term papers, right? Thursday night before they were due on Friday at midnight. Um, so if we give ourselves 12 hours, the task is going to take all 12 hours. So shortening the deadlines whoop, and really honing in on that 80-20, focusing on that 20% in a shorter deadline, you're able to get way, way more done. Always ask yourself, how can I make this easier? Um, huge tip as well. Woo! All right, that was 20 minutes. Uh, I'm not sure what it is after editing, but ugh. thanks so much for watching, guys. If you want this book, there's a link in the description below. 11 Questions Change Your Life is a free ebook I put out with the 11 best questions you can answer in your journal, when you're driving to work, in your head, wherever you want to answer them. And um, thousands of people have done it already. It's a great way to go more into yourself, find out more about you, and use, uh, use it to join the new rich and eliminate and define, no, definition for what you want. That's it, guys. I'll see you back here next week. We are doing, I think we're doing this one, The One Thing, uh, The Surprising Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results by Gary Keller and Jay Papson. If you missed last week's, don't miss it. We did, it's not around here, but we did The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Go back and watch that video. Until next time, leave me a comment in the description below. What was your favorite point of the 10? I want to know down there. All right, guys. Thanks so much. Till next time, stop settling, start living. See you later.